welcome everybody to this next session on the role of role of middle management um, and in relation to inner source. I particularly would like to extend a warm welcome to our speakers here, uh, Denise, uh, Denise from Inner Source Commons, Jamie from GitHub, uh, and Jack Yang from Trend Micro. Thank you very much for taking your time out this evening to speak to us. Now, it, uh, for the format we'll follow to this evening is a panel discussion, um, and so we'll, we'll do some uh, structure around that. So I'd like to ask, you know, the first question we're going to ask our, our panelists here is, what is the role of middle management in, in the source projects? And as you're on my screen, first of all, Denise, would you like to take the first answer? Sure. Um, in typical uh, large engineering organizations, middle managers are used as, you know, frontline managers to the engineers. So they're kind of the first uh, point of authority uh, in most of these setups um, as the engineers practices changing. And um, they can do a lot to make inner source really smoothly adopted by um, making it easy, coming to understand their role and then uh, and then you know making it possible for the engineers to feel less, not more friction uh, as the change is occurring. So that's the best role they can take. Okay, thank you very much. Um, maybe uh, Jamie, I could ask your uh, thoughts on the question of, you know, what is that? What is the role of that middle manager in an in source project? Definitely agree with Denise. I will add that uh, they need to encourage the culture, right? They have to foster collaboration. They have to establish clear roles and criteria for their roles for the code bases that their teams are maintainers of. Um, encourage sharing, encourage growth, and also look at ways to encourage contributions from outside and just making sure that their code and documentation and other resources are actually visible and discoverable to the rest of the organization. Yeah. Sorry, um, Jamie, uh, not to interrupt you, but you seem to be very faint on the call. I just adjusted my volume here. I'll pop it back up. That's okay. And I were checking. Still very quiet. Yep. Yeah, maybe um, I can share some. Okay, Matt. No, I was going to say, Jack, um, if you as, as well, Jamie's adjusting her volume. Would you like to, you know, share your thoughts as well on that role of middle management? Yes, I want to share my experience uh, in Chamaiko. So I very agree that Danny said that the first line management is very important because they have a first line authority to allocate a resource for inner source or non inner source. So. I think two roles is very important for them to in the inner source project as the host repo. The first role is a uh, salesperson, and the second role is the the sponsor. For the salesperson, I I said, uh, be, pray, the middle management play a role of salesperson to have more people know. Oh, this repo is shared. This repo is inner source, so many people are welcome to visit the repo and. They even contribute the, the feature they need by themselves to its repos. So I think the promotion of the inner you know, source repo is very important. So the role of the salesperson of the middle management is very important as well. So I, on my experience, that just opening the repo is not inner you know, source. Uh, the, just open open the repo to trigger the collaboration between the host and the, the, the guest. We will call the inner source. So I think promotion is very important. So the role of salesperson is very important too. For the second role, important role is the sponsor. I think the middle management management should sponsor the trusty committer with sufficient resource and the time for them to serve the visitor or the contributor to make the contribution or collaboration smoother. So once the visitor or the contributor have good experience on inner source. Um, in contribution or visiting, they will be more willing to contribute more, to contribute in the next time. So I think the, uh, the middle management response to the trusted committer will be crucial. So the role is very important. So it's my two, yeah, it's my idea. It's my thought about it. It's interesting to see the, the kind of the, the two different views on that role. Um, my experience has been, 
they kind of fall into two different, when it's middle management, it's, it's a level in the organization, but there's often two different, I said, some, some of two different types of middle manager. There's the one who uh, runs or sponsors an in source initiative or a project. And um, I think Jack very much like your words, they, they fit into that, the concept of a product owner almost, and they're there to advocate for the, the project and for its use and for the code and for what they're building. And then there's the consuming middle management which is a very different, uh, a, a very different um, position um, in some way, because they are often managing people who want to contribute back um, to as part of inner source. And therefore they have a very different role. They're not necessarily uh, in the primary role enabling inner source, but they have a very powerful position sitting either consuming it or contributing back to it within the organization. You know, and I think that um, they, they, one of the pivotal points that they hold there are, is one of they can enable or they can disable that initiative as well. Um, but you know, I, I think that leads quite nicely onto one of the other topics we want to talk about is that you know that that role of middle, middle manager. You know, um, how can they they can boost or they can hinder in a sort of project? So you know, um, where have you seen uh, examples or what, where do you think that they can have problems hindering your inner source initiative? Well, and, um, um, yeah, the, the first time at PayPal that we did um, Intersource, we had to absolve the actual teams from the influence of the middle managers um, because they were working hard and looking at the motivations that they had um, in that company, at least middle managers were um, gatekeepers. They saw themselves as gatekeepers and their um, ideas about their job were noble in, in when I explained them to you, they wanted to keep everybody fully employed. They wanted to be sure that the teams made the targets that had been set. They felt like they were measured based on how successful they were at making those two things possible. And they saw Intersource as a problem because they'd just been through an agile transformation and that definitely you know, cut the productivity down at the beginning. And so they were organizing to reject another um, well-meaning executive decision, basically, uh, as they saw it. They, they, and uh, it took us quite a bit of work to find middle managers who were actually interested in seeing the success of Intersource. I have some good stories about that, but um, I think this is often the lot of middle management in engineering is is that they they develop a thick skin against change that's going that they see as counterproductive yeah i think as um i know you've kind of opened up a whole line of questions there about the role of an engineer manager in an organization as well um but uh, we'll, we'll save that for maybe a, a different conversation um, and I do, I, I have found very similar experiences where um, it's, you've got to um, understand where they're coming from, what the motivations are. And if you can align to those motivations, I think that can get you a long way. Um, but uh, so I'll ask also, I'll ask the same question for Jack. Um, you know, in terms of that, uh, that role of an in source manager, um, where have you seen that they, you know, perhaps not helped your initiatives? Could you excuse me? Could you repeat again the question? Um, how does a inner source? Uh, how do the mid, how does middle management potentially hinder an inner source project? So you say, uh, how do they management inner source pro project? Because hmm. we, uh, we were talking there earlier about you know sometimes they can you know in, in, often with an organization an organization can only take so much change at a time. And, and mm -hmm. this is an example of eBay, you've got a high rate of change and having another change land on the back of a change creates a, an environment where people have um, change fatigue. And so they're not, they're not particularly receptive to that change. Um, sometimes they say, well, I've seen on the, on the two types of middle management for an inner source project, um, the consumers or the ones who are managing, who are not involved, directly involved in inner source can be the biggest blockers for a success of inner source in an organization. Um, simply because uh, examples I've seen, I've seen managers who are very focused on say, a number of points they have to ship per sprint. And mm -hmm. if their developers are involved in 
Uh, the first reaction is they don't maybe understand the power that inner source can bring and the power of reuse can bring to the organization. And if they see the developers working on another project that's not from their backlog and it's not part of the point allocation, then all they care about is how, many, how am I going to get my points quota this month? Because my bonus is related to the number of points I ship. Right. So right. They, they will focus uh -huh. on the short term aim of um, keeping my developers busy on my backlog, not anyone else's. I don't care about anyone else's in the organization. Um, and yeah. it might work for them in the short term, but it typically will slow down the organization in the long run. And also dissuade yeah. um, a lot of their, their own developers. Um, they get annoyed at not being able to contribute back to the greater good and to community code. Um, they might end up leaving as well, which slows the team down further as well as you get uh, problems with knowledge walking out the door and then it takes time to hire somebody back in. It becomes part of this, it can become part of this, this uh, vicious circle of uh, of negativity within the team uh, if you focus purely just on how many points I can deliver per sprint. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's but, one area but where I've seen let that. Me, but let me tell you a story about somebody who got it right in, in the PayPal mm -hmm. organization. Um, this this manager was had, had worked at Sun before he went, came to PayPal. And um, I didn't know him then, but uh, you know he was definitely there. Sun kind of worked in an inner source way. They, they're, um, it was the closest I've seen in a large organization without any introduction into inner source. They, they pretty much allowed cross company contribution, and it was not a big deal to do that. Um, so anyway, he he already had an idea that it could work, and that if the, if PayPal could get it up to scale, it would make everybody's everybody's life a little better. But his big impetus for diving deep into it was actually that the project he was trying to work on got defunded. But that means it fell under the barrier of funded projects um, because some maintenance or, or legacy code cleanup uh, was prioritized. And that meant that he was not going to get the support he needed to get the project done that he was working on. And he contacted me. I happened to be in, in, in India when this all happened to him. And we sat down and he said, could I possibly use InnerSource to still move this project forward? Like, is that allowed? And I said, yeah, absolutely. And so I gave his team the same training that I was there to give to designated InnerSource mm -hmm. participants because we were still choosing pairs because we hadn't just you know, opened for scale out yet. Anyway, I just spent a little time with them, uh, maybe half a day and then left them on their own. And he used what he knew from Sun plus the little training that I gave them <clears throat> to keep that project alive over the next eight months until the next funding round came came around. And um, they were in a perfect position to, you know, finish the work in a recordly short amount of time. I think it was only another quarter after they got refunded. And um, what they were doing was building an indigenous product for India. Um, which there had not been one before. So there was a, a time element to getting it done and the, he could see, but maybe the people back in California didn't see the urgency in the same way. Um, and what he did was he stepped out of the middle ranks and became a visible leader. And he did that by accomplishing good inner source. So, uh, you know, it can also be really good for the middle managers to get behind inner source. So yeah, there can be a lot, a lot of positive. Sorry, Jack, go on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I want to share my experience about convince or invite middle management into an inner source. Uh, yes, uh, the middle management, they are always focused on the team inside, or focus on their team. So sometimes they think inner source is another job. So what I did is that I want to invite them to take the inner source ex experiment which is an experiment that you can allocate a part of, just a little part of your resource on inner source experiment. And then we can set up the criteria of experiment or the duration of the experiment. And then we have agreement on this. Usually the, the duration of the experiment is about uh, one quarter or so, so, so that. So with the agreement, the middle manager can understand how much cost they will pay and uh, they can expect how much benefit they can earn from this experiment. So I think start from small and start from experiment is a good 
a approach to invite or invite the middle major to join inner source to take a try on this because uh, I think the benefit of inner source can come from any aspect, including a knowledge sharing, resource bottleneck, or something like that. So once they have taken the try and then they can get or in experience the benefit by themselves. So I think start from small and start from experiment is a good way to invite them to join in the source. It's my sharing. Very definitely sounds, it sounds like a, I think a, a, a very good idea and one of the, the, the common patterns we often see within a source is that start small and experiment and prove the worth. Um, and yeah. I think there's, you know, there's there's a lot of positivity in the stories for, and we'll touch on this later with middle management about what they can do and contribute, and how they can be critical to the success of it as well. Um, now, as I say, um, hopefully, Jamie, your microphone's working well. Um, we can what, test what, it. There Is you go. Working? You sound okay. we are good. We can hear you. Um, so yeah. Um, very good to hear you, but yeah, what are your thoughts on, you know, the middle management and, you know, what, what are the potential pitfalls and, you know, positivity we can do? Yeah, I definitely agree with everything that's been said, especially the point you made about how middle managers are often reviewed based on what their teams do or do not accomplish, right? So there's little natural encouragement there unless they have buy-in from the top down as well. So I would say that they can hinder um, by not giving time, right? to their direct reports to not just go and do their day job, but to go out and see what is available to inner source to make sure that their documentation and their own code bases is inviting for other people to come and reuse it, to contribute to it, and making sure that they have set up some sort of communication channel for people who are not direct reports, for people outside their immediate team or even department or business line. And then also, you know, making sure that they set up some sort of SLA system how quickly do they respond to issues that are raised or comments on code or even code reviews for contributions? So if they're not basically acting as a maintainer and encouraging their team to do these things and creating this documentation and governance to support this culture, then we're going to have a harder time fostering that community aspect. And then the last thing I'll add is this idea of open and transparency that we take from open source, right? An open restaurant is inviting, but a transparent restaurant actually shows you how the sausage is made. And we want code bases to show you how the sausage is made so everybody can go and make their own sausage and help make the sausage for that team. I don't think I've ever heard that the sausage the software compared to a, a sausage before. The software factory is a sausage factory, maybe not. Um, but you know, I, I think there is a lot there. Um, I like the comments there about um, SLAs against the issues to pull requests, because um, there's a lot that they can do and contribute uh, to the success of an source project there as well. Um, I think you know behind a lot of these, it's really the common theme of you have to have that empathy with the manager, manager and what they what their situation is. Um, if you too often, I think sometimes I've been guilty of this. You go along and you've got an ask, and you just the ask is for, I guess for. Um, ultimately for the right thing, but it's, it's my ask, it's not their ask. And I haven't really stopped to understand what their motivation is um, to help them, you know, um, to agree and to cooperate. Um, and I think if you approach in terms of not what the manager can do for you, but what you can do for the manager, you often will have a lot better result um, with the manager. Because um, you there, you're there to solve their problems often. What you've got um, as a way of working, as a way of community, a way of knowledge sharing, will actually solve a lot of the problems um, and make their day-to-day -day life easier, I think. And it's really a question of, you know, maybe reframing some of that question or how you approach management and show them the benefits that's there um, if they're working with this, um, using this way of working as well. Which kind of takes me, that kind of, we turn that aspect of, you know, um, you know, it's very easy to be negative about management, so about engineer managers. Um, I think it's a, it's a very difficult role. You're often squeezed, you know, between the middle and the top. Um, but it's often very easy to be negative. But I think actually here, you know, although I, I like about resource is that it's overridingly positive. Um, it's there to create a positive change. It's there to make life, people's lives better. Um, so with that, I mean, how would you recommend that you, you know, how could you encourage middle management to 
to help? Um, and how could they be, how do you turn one from perhaps a, a naysayer of inner source or a suspicion of inner source to the biggest advocate? I could go first on this one. One one thing that I like to do, especially with middle management, to get them on board and get them to buy in, is have them estimate how much time and potentially money is put into hiring, onboarding, and turnover, and whether there's any uh, ability to move laterally if there's an urgent need for extra engineering power. Is that with the aspect of, I guess, of being able to move your engineers across the different teams or to a different project? Exactly, yeah, just yeah. As, as needs arise and also to give flexibility to developers as business needs shift and change and get reprioritized. I think, that, yeah, that there's a lot there. If you, I said, if your code's in the open, then it's much easier for people to pick up. Um, and I've, I have found that inner source can often help create a, a common way of working between teams as well. Because again, the, the, everything is in the open, the ways of working, the way that the software is built is in the open. And find those good ideas to propagate around the company between different teams, which can make it a lot easier to change, uh, you know, to change developing one project to the next. Um, Jack, um, if I can ask you the same question, you know, in this story of positivity, um, how do you make your uh, middle manager your biggest advocate? Yeah, the, uh, from my experience, I will. I will I usually try to share, share, keep sharing story for, with them about inner source, including the story about Pepo, even Microsoft and Google, and the, and the collect the, the story I collect industry collected. So I will share a good story with them and the, to help them know that you know so what inner source can benefit them. So one is the sharing, keep sharing, keep keep them aware of in the benefit of inner source, and the second thing. The second part I think is the most important is that uh, I I would try to have a meeting, have a talk with them to 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 discuss about what the obstacle they have faced or what the challenge they have faced in their team, and uh, if the challenge can be resolved or mitigated by inner source. So through the discuss this discussion with them, they, we can know uh, if inner source can help them. So I think the. The focus of the, the focus of middle management was want to solve the problem of their prop, the, their teams, so they can leverage a lot of practice in, and I think you know so it could be one of them. So I think I will go back to the the, the original is that what's the problem the team want to resolve, mm -hmm. and the the problem is can be resolved through inner source. If yes, if we can take stuff from the experiment, so. It's uh, what I do in my experience. The first one is sharing, and the second one is to have a discussion with the team to figure out the problem. Yeah, I think there's a, there are very few problems that you can't resolve generally through a good conversation. Um, and, and Denise, uh, what are your thoughts on you know that 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 positivity about how we can you know turn that middle management to your biggest advocate? Well, I, if you again examine their motives at the end of the day, just like everybody, they're trying to get the, the best outcome for themselves and their team. So if you can demonstrate to them that this other way is a better way, um, it, it can go a long way. I've seen middle managers who, you know, became advocates, became huge advocates after they uh, actually worked with it for a while. I've also seen both senior and middle managers who made up their mind before they ever even tried it. And um, you can often, you know, get them to do, to give it a go if you can identify that that's what they're doing and, and call them out on it uh, in a way that's culturally appropriate in that, in that company. Um, we at sometimes had to uh, resort to CTO, um, not coercion, let's say cheerleading. Uh, we created some extrinsic rewards for managers that um, we sh shouldn't have had to create, but, but you know, there they were. And um, because of that very painful agile transformation that the company had gone through before, uh, I was very interested in designing something that wasn't gonna go down the same path. So features of that agile transformation that gave people things to push against included 
Um, they recommended a different tooling than the company was using, even though they had JIRA and they could have run the backlog through JIRA. They used another tool that was going to give the management a better top-down view and people hated the other tool. And so, you know, we, we decided to meet people where they were at and not create new tooling, just make it a method change. Um, because they training is rep recommended, you know, agile coaching is recommended for an agile transformation. They were spending a lot of money on agile coaching and there were, you know, a few hundred people engaged in it that were not regular employees of the company. And looking at that budget and how little penetration they got for that spend, I decided to not spend money on trainers. And that's why we created online assets, which you can find it in our source commons. Mm. Um, we have not done one for middle management though. And I think that that's one of the things that we should have on our slate of, of you know, next topics to cover in the training. Um, and we made it, we made it as cheaply, you know, set up to adopt as we possibly could. Uh, and we got much more penetration in a much shorter time than the agile transformation had achieved. But that's because individual engineers became advocates for two reasons. Most companies that, that are adopting Agile at the scale that PayPal did are not going to actually practice Agile. They're going to practice Wagile, which is like waterfall with an Agile veneer. And if that sounds familiar to you, then you know. <laughs> um, so the, those Agile transformations end up not empowering the engineers or the middle managers. But, in, but InterSource really can empower them because they can scratch their own itch. It's, it's a different way of thinking about how to get stuff done. So, um, you know, we, we let it speak for itself as people discovered how great it was. And then the one more thing that we had going for us was the practice of code review was not, um, it had devolved at PayPal to, into kind of rubber stamping the superstar players. Um, and that meant that the, there were quality issues and they, could see exactly what each quality defect cost because PayPal actually pays um, customers for missed opportunity if the engine isn't working. Like if at Christmas you can't get stuff done, you can't get orders in because your PayPal is down, um, they will pay you for that lost revenue, right? So they know exactly what def defects cost. And instituting real code review is something that a lot of the middle managers have wished they could do, but the culture was pushing against it. So what we did was we, we gave them permission during the beginning of their inner source journey to keep their trusted committers busy by rehearsing how to do mentorship using check-ins from the actual team that they were part of. Or in other words, we snuck code review on them uh, mm -hmm. under the guise of training the trusted committer role. And they got measurable improvements, 25% bump the first week in in. Uh, quality just from having another set of eyes on the code. So there's ways you can get the, the trusted, I mean, the, the middle managers to feel like this is going to be better by showing them some of those early gains. Um, it's still more expensive at the beginning to, to do the mentorship, right? But if you go to the trouble to collect that advice and it, it can be reused, you know, the, the, the do ad hoc documentation that's created by the, the mentor, the trusted committer, telling the contributor, the aspirant contributor, what they need to change in order for their code to be um, mergeable and deployable um, can really you know, go a long way to making onboarding faster the next time somebody needs to make a contribution like that because they can read that prior thread and not take the trusted committer's time to you know, explain all of that again. So. Um, that gives engineers power and it gives middle managers confidence that their engineers are going to be more effective. So there you go. Yeah. I think there's, a, there's another thread, is thread there about um, having data. And obviously if you can give the middle managers the data, the hard data about the benefits, that will go a long way to persuading them. You know, um, I think, you know, there's a common theme here of, you know, you start small and experiment, you gather the data, mm -hmm. you understand the middle management, you understand where they're coming from what the motivations are, um, what, what they're incentivized by, and then uh, you know, shaping your argument to fit that worldview, um, and then turning them hopefully into the, some of your biggest advocates. And it, it's a pattern I've seen quite uh, often, time and time again, that it often spreads 
uh, much further than you think through or engineer talking to engineer and recommending practices and seeing those uh, the benefits and the joy they get from it you're sparking developer joy here quite frequently and that, that you know that will spread its word um, I had one manager um, he was a product owner of a uh, quite a critical engineering product that was under an awful lot of stress um, and they were to deliver upon the promises of the product and they were uh, struggling to get as many features as possible to help drive adoption. But through a source, they were able to get these additional uh, features in that helped drive adoption and that adoption made help them achieve their goals. And that, you know, they became in turn one of the biggest advocates of the program. I think um, we're up against time now. It's been, as with all these panel discussions, it's been uh, really interesting to hear everyone's views. And I could, we could always, I think we said this at the end of every panel, we could carry this on for twice as long because you know, everyone's ideas and contributions spark for other questions. But we have the second half of the event for that one. But for now, um, we'll end the recording in a moment. And I'd just like to say thank you very much to all our speakers for volunteering the time and uh, sharing their expertise and wisdom with us. And um, we'll see you around next time for the next panel. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, Denise.